I got lucky, I get to go first. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things to say, and I have lots of stories to tell, but no time to tell it in, so I won't go there now. But we are gathering at about four over at the American Legion Hall, and you are invited to come there and play games and listen to stories, swap memories of Gary, so please come. I first met Gary in 1976, which was the first Gen Con I attended, and uh, I was uh, disappointed with the quality of the events, and I wasn't smart enough to keep my mouth shut, <laughs> and they said to me, um, you think you can do better? And I said, yeah. You want to run an event? I'll do it next year. No, now. <laughs> so I wound up doing an event the very first year, and I closed the convention, and People sat around waiting for my event to wind down. Everybody watching, Gary was sitting there watching. That wasn't the last time Gary watched me close a convention for him. <laughs> I had the pleasure of working with Gary. Um, he was the one who hired me in 1979. I got to go up for an interview. I was very nervous. Sat down with him. We talked a little bit about the job. And then he found out that I have a minor in history in ancient Near Eastern religion, as a matter of fact, and he immediately started talking about ancient, <laughs> and ancient society, and so we hit it off really fast. My last experience with Gary was this summer, again, at Gen Con. So it's an interesting cycle for me that it was completed, where Gary and I, a fan of his from 30 years ago, sat on a panel, just the two of us and the uh, current owner of Gen Con and reminisced about 40 years of Gen Con and what it had meant to us in the industry. And what it meant was a gathering of friends, kind of like today. Um, I'm an editor on top of uh, quite a number of things, and a quote comes to mind. Um, what do you call um, a woman who has lost her husband that's a widow? We have a word for that. What do you call a family that has lost a father, and their parents an orphan? But we don't really have a word for what you call someone who has lost a friend. Sad, happy that we shared the time, joyful in the memory that we had that chance to live the life with him and share the experiences. A friend of mine, uh, Dave Cook, used to have a sign on his uh, office wall said, the one who dies with the most toys wins. <laughs> I think he got it wrong. I think it's the one who dies with the, with the most friends wins. Thank you. I'm Jim Ward. Harold was supposed to say that, but uh, he's bawling in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Gail had me come up because uh, I only have one good story about Gary. The time is 1974. Are you going to tell the temporary joke? No. The time is 1974, and young Jim Ward is fresh out of college, and he goes to the Lake Geneva News Agency every Tuesday look at the new books. And so young Jim Ward is over there and he's picking out books from the shelf. And this biker looking dude comes in and he starts grabbing books too. And so we're both going down the shelves. And I have seven books in my hand and I'm looking at them and trying to figure out how, how I can pay for all of them. And this guy has the exact seven books in his hand. And we kind of got laughing about it and, and he introduced himself as Gary Gygax. 
And I just couldn't get over the fact that he looked like a hell's angel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, he said that he had a game where you could play Conan the Barbarian, because we had two else break the camp books in our hands, and uh, you could fight Set. And oh man, I was hooked. <laughs> I just had to go play that game. And you know, that generous guy taught me how to play on his back porch and he had these gorgeous daughters that were very distracting. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I instantly said, Gary, you gotta do a science fiction version of this game. And he says, Jim, why don't you try it? And Gary was constantly being generous like that. And uh, he, he was just a joy to be uh, beaten by in game after game. Um, I can't tell you the, the many Thursday nights this, these last couple months that I've played over at his house and he's beaten me in Transamerica and Settlers of Catan and pretty much every game we played, Gary won. So uh, he, he was a marvelous man and I'm sure he's going to be remembered for a long, long time. So I'm telling Steve Chenault to come up here. He's the troll arts guy. And I'll try not to cry all the way back to my chair. <laughs> I've had the pleasure of knowing Gary for about six or six or seven years. I, I really can't remember how we met or how it all came about, but we, we've been in pretty close contact for a while. Uh, and when news, when news came over of his passing, I was trying to kind of get a grip on it, and people began to call, and emails began to come in, and a news agency called it. I don't want to embarrass them, so I'm not going to say who, but she, the young lady asked me, um, do, you know, you know, do you know Gary Gygax, and so forth and so on. And I began to kind of be rude and stammer around. I you know, didn't want to talk right now to anybody, et cetera, et cetera. She said, well, did he, did he live in a dungeon? <laughs> I'm standing there and, and everything kind of went white. And I thought, oh, okay, I've got to fix this. <laughs> this goes really bad. And, and she, she also asked uh, something about a cult game. And it just, oh. yeah, so it was, they did a very, very, very good job. But she, she did ask me a very pertinent question about it. She said, um, what kind, and once we got through all of that and she had figured out, he didn't live in a dungeon, and she, she asked me what, what type of man Gary was, and how would you describe him? And uh, I stammered for a minute, I couldn't think of what type of man Gary was, and I thought, uh, well, he was, he was someone who enjoyed good, good food, and he enjoyed good drink, and he enjoyed good company. And when I think about Gary, I don't think of, of all those things that that happened and didn't happen and, and books and publishing and, and business and all of that. I, I really just, I, I remember sitting on his porch or smoking out behind a convention hall or sitting in the Serbian gourmet restaurant to just talking and telling stories. He, he told story after story and his favorite stories to me weren't about business. They weren't about anything. He, he liked telling stories about when he was a young man. And you would have these these wild adventure stories of uh, of Lake Geneva when it was cold and, and dark, and he would go to the thing, the movie theater, and walking home at night, and he was terrified, and he would describe these shadows and all kinds of stuff. And I thought, this is this is where it all is. This is this is the man. But when I think about Gary, that's that's what I think about that that young man that that stayed a child his entire life and, and was kind enough and generous enough to give all of that to us so that we could continue on and, and be children ourselves when life isn't what it's supposed to be or is it difficult. For, for, for that, I, I thank Gary and, and I'll remember him always as a very close friend. Luke. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Luke Gygax. Um, thank you all for coming here uh, today. Um, and, and thank you so much, uh, uh, Harold, uh, Jim, Steve. I uh, appreciate the kind words and uh, the great stories that, that, that you had for us here. Um, it's a very tough day today. Um, <clears throat> obviously, I love my father very much. And uh, I wrote down a few things that I, that I might want to say, and I, I think I may just speak, speak from the heart, though. Um, kind of the, 
the question I really was thinking is who was Gary Gygax? And from speaking to everyone today, I would say it depends on who you asked. He was he was a man, a different he had a lot of different a lot of different titles. An author, innovative game designer, uh, rebel, uh, punster, uh, <laughs> uh, some might even say royalty. If he was at their gaming table, um, but for me, I think I better just stick to uh, talking about what I know best, and that's uh, Gary Gygax uh, that I like to call Dad. Um, my dad was my best friend and my role model uh, from the earliest days that I can remember. Uh, my first memories of my dad uh, were uh, down in the basement of our house at 330 Center Street, um, and he was a, a cobbler or shoemaker, and. Uh, I had my own apron uh, that he made for me, and uh, he let me work by him. Uh, and he was very careful. I think he must have learned quickly that uh, being a young child, I wanted to do everything he was doing. So I had my own, spe my own set of special tools that, uh, that he uh, gave me and uh, strongly encouraged me to only use my tools, they're mine, because uh, I'm sure he ground them down to be uh, duller than a butter knife. <laughs> and I slice off my hand. And I thank him for that. Uh, uh, also, our basement was a place where we spent some family times down there. Uh, it doubled as the production, the production line in the early days for some of the first TSR games. Um, so we'd sit down in the, in the basement sometimes from time to time uh, assembling all the various components into, into boxes. And I remember some uh, bitter complaints from some of my siblings. <laughs> and something about violation of child labor laws. <laughs> uh, uh, another thing I remember about my dad that other people have mentioned and is very true is that he was a great storyteller. Um, he liked to tell stories. And uh, as his children, we would all uh, beg him to tell us a good night story. We looked forward to that a lot. And uh, he had a standard answer for us uh, that he would always give us. And he'd say, we please tell a story? And he'd say, okay, I'll tell you a story. I had a little dolly, I hung it on the wally, and that's Ollie. And of course, we'd immediately start going, no, 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 Dad tells you. He's like, okay, he wants to tell another story? <laughs> okay, I'll tell you a story of old Mother Maury, and now my story's begun. And the protest would start again, because it was coming next. And say, I'll tell you another of Jack and his brother, and now my story is done. And of course, he'd be hopping up and down saying, no, no, tell us a real story. <laughs> so he'd give it eventually after torturing us uh, for a little while. And uh, we'd retreat to a bedroom and dim the lights and uh, get ready, and he would, he would ask us what kind of story we wanted to hear. And of course, there were the standards that we, that we would have. Uh, such as uh, diminutive scarlet uh, equestrian, equestrian cape, <laughs> otherwise known as a, a little red riding hood. Uh, it was my dad, so it was not a little red riding hood. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, my, a couple, a couple of the good ones that we liked, or that I liked a lot anyway. I, I, can't I swear for the others were uh, about the giant Abi Yo Yo. That was a great one, and the three Billy Goats Gruff. Uh, I remember those stories. But of course, I was the youngest of his children at that time, and so my very most favorite story was uh, about a young protagonist named Boyson, who was the uh, uh, the son of a poor uh, fisherman, I'm assuming Japanese fisherman. Uh, and Boyson uh, would have many great adventures course in, in, in the realm and a couple of the recurring characters uh, in that were uh, Captain Ernie Zawa who was obviously meant to be my older brother who might sometimes pick on me uh, and then General Ruko who would always who was a great hero and would of course order Captain Ernie Zawa to do the menial tasks uh, in the story <laughs> so I always got you know I identified with boy son and there was General Ruko so that was my favorite story uh, you know, by, by far, that was my favorite one. I can't swear for Ernie or any other stuff. <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, gaming was an absolutely huge part of, uh, of uh, my dad's life and in our life as, as, you know, as our father. All of us would sit at the gaming table at one, at one time or another. And, uh, some of us still game to, today and, and, and others not, not nearly as much. Um, but my dad was a real competitor. I just wanted to throw this in. I just, just thought this because people were talking about how he wins at games a lot. And he was not adverse to using a little psychological warfare in a game he wasn't doing as well as he wanted to. As I remember, I was a young, vulnerable high school student, uh, and we were playing Operation Overlord, which is a very long uh, chit, you know, 
board game, and I love to play the Germans because I like to, the, the German uniforms and all. I like I really enjoyed the playing the German side, and uh, so I had just uh, matched up the Second SS Panzer Division and and driven his units back up to the sea out of can, and I was I was I was I was doing very well, uh, but of course I had an exchange or something. I should I rolled bad poorly on a move, on an attack, and. Uh, he started uh, jeering and, and saying, oh, you've lost the game now, it's all over for you, may as well pack it in. <laughs> and of course, of course, I was very disappointed in him and I said, oh, all right, forget it. And I said, let's pack it up, this stupid game. And so as we packed it up and we took all the chits and it was too late to return them, he said, wow, you really had my bag against the wall, you were gonna kick my butt. And I was like, oh. He said, but since you gave up, I win. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, that's the competitive spirit. But, uh, Let's see. The first, the first gaming I, I remember, uh, if I can just share that with you, was was a uh, uh, young man again. Uh, Ernie, I know Ernie was there uh, playing for sure, and uh, I got to uh, play the young uh, a man at arms uh, with a group of adventurers who had just entered the village of Hamlet, and we're going to go explore some ruins on the edge of town. And of course, uh, um, uh, we just got into the game and gotten things going. And I was pretty excited about shaking the dice, and I got to do a little bit of that. But unfortunately, uh, there was a something I couldn't defeat, and that was uh, my mother in bedtime. Uh, <laughs> so before the adventure ended, of course, I had to go off to bed because uh, it, it was that time. But I did get to play that man at arms, who later became Otis the Ranger, on many occasions after that. And uh, you know, I was able to play uh, against the giants and explore the shrine of the Kuatoa and descend into the Underdark and fight the Drow uh, with that character, and, and those were some really great memories uh, that, that I had. Uh, at heart, my dad was still a kid, uh, no matter what his age, uh, and that meant that uh, no matter what we were doing, uh, a lot of times it devolved into a game or a play of some kind. Um, and it might be just from getting out the lawnmowers to mow the lawn. Uh, we had a new riding lawnmower and an old riding lawnmower, so we pulled them out and we had to see which one would go faster around the circular driveway. So, so that was fun. Uh, I don't know if we ever mowed the lawn, though. Uh, and occasionally, uh, when I was feeling a little ill from, from school, uh, my dad was working at home, of course, so he was there to take care of me. Um, sometimes when I was feeling bad, we might break out a nice short game like uh, Source of the Nile. Or, uh, <laughs> or Empire Builder. And surprisingly, I, my sickness didn't get much better uh, until you know three or four days go by, and, and then uh, Gail would catch wise and come in and bust us, <laughs> and I would have to go back to school, and he'd have to get back to work, so we couldn't spend the day's game anymore. Uh, and uh, another thing uh, that I think about my dad is that he had a that he had a great sense of humor. Well, okay, he had a sense of humor anyway, <laughs> depending on who you talk to. Uh, uh, one thing is for sure is that he passed on his unique uh, brand of, of humor uh, to his children, uh, much to the uh, disappointment of those who uh, have to spend time with us, uh, or their dismay, I should say. Uh, he particularly loved puns, uh, as I'm sure many of you know. He loved them, he relished them, and uh, I was one of his favorite targets. Uh, he just enjoyed the look on my face at, when he finally got to that lame punchline after about 15 or 20 minutes of buildup. So uh, I would always groan, and that only got me more puns. So I didn't learn my lesson. So. Uh, uh, another story that might illustrate kind of uh, my dad's sense of humor growing up uh, for me is when I was a young boy, I was learning uh, the alphabet and the difference between vowels and, and consonants in, uh, in school. And of course, all the, the, the vowels were, were feminine and the, and the consonants were, were masculine. Uh, and I was sharing that with my dad, so I was you know, proud. And he said, no, 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 son, you, you, you've got it wrong. He said, uh, you know, it's not Mr. B, it's Miss B. And uh, so he said, you know, you can remember because Miss B has big, beautiful, bouncing, and I think you can figure out what they, where he went with that. So, uh, of course, I was, I was very proud and excited about that, so I shared that with my teacher the next day. <laughs> and she thanked me for my contribution. <laughs> um, and there's other things, I don't know if anyone uh, is familiar with some of the a little bit older sayings, like if uh, wishes were horses, beggars would ride. You some of us have heard of that. And if wishes were fishes, we'd never go hungry. I only learned that much later in life 
For when I was growing up, it was, if wishes were horses, we'd never go hungry. <laughs> and if wishes were fishes, beggars would ride. And I never understood that. It took me many years. So, I, I, you know, I appreciate that. Something I'll always remember. And uh, my father, he was an avid Chicago Bears football fan. So Sundays during football season were spent uh, in front of the TV uh, watching our valiant heroes uh, combat uh, such evil doers as the, the Pittsburgh Thieves, uh, the Miami <laughs> Fish, and many others that uh, I won't mention in polite company. <laughs> uh, oh yes, Minnesota had an interesting yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, my dad uh, was very proud of the position that he attained uh, in the gaming community. Um, he enjoyed going to conventions and being able to speak to gamers and share games them, share stories with them. And uh, I know that he, he, he really enjoyed it. That, that, that's something he loved. And although uh, some people may have idolized him, I don't think he ever let that go to his head. I think to him, he was always one of the guys, one of the gamers, a, a, you know, a game aficionado amongst friends. Um, yeah, he was always aware of his humanity and his fallibility. Um, my dad was also passionate uh, about politics and history, and I spent many hours with him discussing, uh, you know, political situations or historical situations, and uh, I think he enjoyed and excelled uh, at political discourse and reasoned debate, um, for the most part. There may be occasions where he just said, "I'm right, you're full of it." But <laughs> uh, another important thing to mention is that my father uh, he adored his children and. He took great pride in his beautiful grandchildren, and I know he enjoyed spending time with them, and whenever, whenever we had the opportunity to be together, it was very special to me. Um, today, uh, this week, uh, I lost someone who was very, very special to me, uh, a man that I love dearly, uh, my friend, my role model, uh, a great person. And I just want to say, Dad, I love you, and I salute you.